So thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And thanks uh, to TP. And uh, this is actually a little excursion from what I usually do. My uh, actual work is, is very shady and dark and it involves something called loop quantum gravity. And you never know where these loop quantum gravity people lurk because our previous speaker was actually a, a, a postdoc or a visitor in, in Syracuse when I was a graduate, beginning graduate student. So hi Miles and uh, nice to see you. Um, so let me start then. So this is the title of my talk, a note on entanglement entropy, coherent states and gravity. And as the talk proceeds, uh, I'll make the connection between the three words in the title um, clear. So let me first start with um, just giving you what the logical structure of the talk is, just summarizing that. And I'll start with a few words about gravity and I apologize in advance if there are any experts here uh, because there's a broad audience so I didn't know quite where to pitch it and besides which I think the work also is not technically that, that advanced. So. Okay, so gravity is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity which interprets gravity as the geometry of space-time and the dynamics of uh, space-time geometry is described by the Einstein equations which relate curvature to the matter stress energy content of space-time. The trajectories of freely, freely falling particles and light rays are fixed once you give me the space-time geometry. So they move on the shortest distance paths they can, the so-called geodesics. In this, most of this talk, I will be interested in certain configurations of the gravitational field called black holes. So by gravitational field, of course, I mean space-time geometry. And the space-time geometry of a black hole is such that it describes certain null trajectories which don't make it out to infinity. So there's a part of the space-time which is not visible uh, to the outside and that's why you have a hole. And it turns out that black holes display thermodynamic behavior. So this is very surprising because black holes are simply solutions to some nonlinear partial differential equations which are the Einstein equations. I mean they were invented or by Einstein to describe gravity with no thermodynamic intent and it's very surprising that some of the solutions actually display thermodynamic behavior. In the case of the black hole, the geometric quantity which behaves like thermodynamic entropy is the surface area of the black hole. In general, when we do thermodynamics and then we do statistical mechanics, one finds that thermodynamic entropy arises from the statistical mechanics of some underlying microscopic degrees of freedom. And this of course brings us to the following question, what could be the microscopic degrees of freedom which endow the black hole configurations of the gravitational field with an entropy equal to um, their surface area. So there's a beautiful answer suggested by Raphael Sorkin a long time ago, and all the way in I think the early 80s. And he suggested that the microscopic degrees of freedom are the degrees of freedom of quantum matter fields in the vicinity of the surface of the black hole. So you have the black hole geometry, you have matter on this geometry, you put the matter in its uh, uh, vacuum. So all the matter fields are in their vacuum. And you find that field operators inside and outside the horizon are very strongly correlated and therefore the vacuum state is highly entangled. And if you compute their entangled, entanglement entropy, you find that the entanglement entropy depends on the surface geometry and it actually scales as the surface area. However, the precise proportionality constant and indeed as we shall see even the finiteness of this entanglement entropy depends on some assumptions uh, on unknown ultraviolet physics of quantum gravity. So that is a, a drawback of, uh, of this. We really need to understand it better and for that we need quantum gravity. So is there a way of still establishing um, a, a relation between entanglement entropy and black hole surface area which somehow evades any assumptions on uh, deep ultraviolet physics? And this was um, uh, sort of a, a way around it was proposed by Eugenio Bianchi a couple of years ago. And what he's noticed is or what he says is that in thermodynamic processes, what is really important are variations of extensive quantities like the entropy, how much 
heat goes in, how much the entropy changes, etc. So, you aren't really interested in variations and not in the quantities themselves, or the values of the quantities themselves. Now, in the black hole case, if you make a variation of the geometry of the black hole by sending in some matter which is in low energy, far away from the Planck scale, and maybe the, you can send the matter in, in a quantum state, then perhaps you could compute the change in black hole area on the one hand and on the other hand since you are varying from the vacuum of the matter to some low energy state of the matter, you could also compute the change in entanglement entropy and if Raphael's proposal is, is goes through then maybe these changes are exactly equal to each other. So, uh, my only and small negative contribution to this whole story is that if you took the varied state to be a coherent state, then it turns out that Bianchi's ideas don't quite work and that is really uh, sort of the end point of, of, of uh, my talk today. So, I'll first describe what has gone before and then tell you uh, about my little contribution to the story. Before doing that, um, one may also inquire as to a broader question. Namely, whether not only black holes, but more general gravitational plus matter field configurations exhibit thermodynamic features. Perhaps one may, you know, one may even ask, can the Einstein equations themselves be interpreted as conditions of thermodynamic equilibrium? And this is a path, for, you know, which followed by, uh, in particular, by Ted Jacobson. And he has supportive evidence most recently through his maximal vacuum entanglement entropy hypothesis. But unfortunately, again, coherent states also provide an obstruction to these ideas for deriving the Einstein equations um, from this hypothesis. But I don't think I'll have time to talk about that. Let's see how, how, uh, how the talk goes. Okay, so this is the plan of the talk. I'll first review uh, the definition of black holes and some of their um, thermodynamic properties. Then I'll describe uh, Raphael's proposal and, and Raphael himself is here, so you can ask him more questions about his proposal uh, and its dependence on unknown uh, ultraviolet physics and then describe Bianchi's ideas. Then I will uh, tell you about coherent states and how they give you an obstruction to these ideas and if there's time then I'll briefly comment on, on uh, Ted's, uh, Ted Jacobson. Okay, so what is a black hole? As I said, it's some geometry of space-time and it's non-compact, it's infinite. And so in order to present it on a piece of paper, as I've done, I draw it in the form of what is called a Penrose diagram. And in this diagram, what I'm going, to, what, what is done is infinitely far away points are brought to a finite distance by making some singular coordinate transformations. And they are made in a careful manner so that light rays always propagate at 45 degrees. Right? So all 45 degrees lines are light trajectories. Now the place where in the infinite past where all light rays begin is called past null infinity which is this line over here and the place where all light rays end in the infinite future is called future null infinity which is over here. This is a, a schematic representation of matter which is you know in the remote past comes and collapses to form a black hole. This wiggly line is where the field, gravitational field blows up, the curvature is infinite and it's called the singularity. So when you say that you have a black hole, you sit over here at future null infinity and you look down into the space time and if you don't see all of the space time, then you say there's a black hole. Right? Light is not coming to you from some part of the space time. The last set, now, um, I mean, yeah, what I forgot to mention is that this diagram represents spherical collapse. So, there's spherical symmetry and each point on this diagram is a two sphere, right? Imagine a two sphere, uh, each point is a two sphere. So, this is like an infinitely large two sphere at infinity. If I look at the last set of light rays which just about make it to infinity, then they form a three dimensional set and that set is called the horizon of the black hole. Now, this is a straight line and every point on it is a two sphere. So, this the topology of this horizon is a two sphere across the real line. That's a three dimensional set. And once all the matter has fallen in into the black hole, into the singularity, 
then this the, the external geometry stabilizes and kind of settles down and the geometry of the horizon also settles down and it becomes time independent. So, if I look at blow up the geometry of this, this um, uh, horizon at late times, then, uh, then what you will find is that there are light rays which move along the horizon and they neither converge nor do they diverge. They just have a constant geometry, like a collimated beam. So, this over here is the black hole interior that, that is like if I take this part of the horizon then this whole inside is this interior, whatever is outside is the exterior and these are the light rays which are going along the black hole horizon neither converging nor diverging just going straight out to infinity. Uh, just for experts uh, in some formulas which will appear later the time flow vector field along the horizon I am denoting by psi. So, this is the kind of killing vector for the on the uh, <coughs> uh, parallel to the horizon. Okay. So, now let me inquire remember what I wanted to do was to perturb the black hole finally when I was going to do Bianchi's stuff. So, let me perturb the black hole and let me release some matter and let it cross the horizon. So, what happens? What, what happens to the geometry? So, there is a uh, since gravity is attractive, whenever matter crosses the path of light rays, it has this gravitational field, it attracts the light rays and the light rays start converging, okay, sorry. So, so here we have you know the horizon without any perturbation is just going along and then a light you know some matter falls in and it focuses the light. A black hole is not going to disappear, it is just going to change its geometry a little bit and there will be a new horizon. But this new horizon will have rays in the infinite future which also are neither converging nor diverging. So, these guys of course, do not make it right, they just form what are called caustics. So, in order to get something which is ultimately going to converge, you have to look at light rays which are initially divergent right. So, when they hit the matter field over here, they slowly start to converge and then they emerge you know collimated. Therefore, the area of the cross section of the of this horizon is larger than it would have been had the matter not crossed it. So, basically what is happening is that the black hole is eating up matter and its mass is increasing and the geometry responds in such a way that the area of the horizon increases. Okay? So, that is what I want you to remember. So, the light is along the horizon right. What defines the horizon are the last right light rays which have zero expansion right. So, if you take that unperturbed scenario with a stationary horizon at late times and at very late times you drop in some matter then those rays are going to converge. So, those are no longer the horizon of the new black hole. You have to look at a larger area cross section and that is what this this diagram shows you. Okay? Fine. Of course, larger is the amount of stress energy which gets into the black hole, more is going to be its focusing effect and therefore, larger has to be the compensatory initial divergence and therefore, larger is going to be the final area. So, the area change is going to be proportional to the stress energy which, which goes across the horizon and one can use basic differential geometry due to Professor Roy Chaudhary a long, long time ago combined with the dynamics of gravity defined by the Einstein equations and one can compute what this area change is and yeah the, the, the what I have written is, is a little you know, clumsy, but basically you can use these two things and I am going to call in the resulting formula the geodesic tangent vector along the light ray tra trajectory as L and psi is just you know that time uh, symmetry vector along the horizon. And then what one finds is, is some formula like this where the change in area is given by the integral of the stress energy which goes across the horizon as you expect. And there is also this term kappa which is a, a geometric characteristic of, of, of the horizon and how it is embedded in the space time and it is called the surface gravity. What I can do is I can take this 8 pi g and put it into the area and put the kappa over here and then this this, this is like the energy which has gone into the black hole. So, it looks like a heat term, kappa looks like a temperature, it is constant on the horizon uh, of the unperturbed black hole and then I can maybe identify the change in area with the entropy, this just looks like a Clausius relation. 
So one may then speculate that, well, area by G is approximately something like entropy. The surface gravity is, is you the temperature. And in fact, Hawking showed in the 70s uh, using uh, the approximation of quantum fields on uh, matter fields on, on, on uh, black hole space time that black holes, although classically nothing can escape them, quantum mechanically they actually radiate and therefore their temperature has this h bar inside it, but the temperature is indeed proportional to kappa. So if the temperature is this, then from this formula one can read off what the entropy is and the entropy is the area of the black hole divided by 4 gh, gh bar and I have just put the velocity of light equal to 1. And GH bar is, is, is an area and it's called the Planck area and it's, it's very, 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 very small. And so for a macroscopic black hole, this entropy is just absolutely humongous. Incidentally, if the area is identified with entropy, this identification also rescues the second law of thermodynamics because you can imagine that you have a black hole and you have an entropic object and you throw the entropic object into the black hole. And if the black hole had no entropy or thermodynamic properties, entropy would have disappeared in, from the observable universe and you would have, you know, broken the second law of thermodynamics. But if the black hole has an entropy proportional to the area, then what you want is the initial area of the black hole plus the entropy outside is always going to be less than the final area of the black hole and the entropy outside. And since the, you know, a small area change can cause such a humongous change in entropy, the second law is safe. And this was probed in great detail by thought experiments by um, Bekenstein in, in, in the 70s and, and, and onwards. So this is all to tell you that black holes have an entropy proportional to their area. And we'd like to now uh, go to uh, the next part of the talk, which is to try and, and examine one candidate for the microscopic degrees of freedom which would underlie this thermodynamic behavior. So that is Raphael's proposal. So let me describe it briefly. Now, uh, before doing that, uh, this is a fact that the curvature near the horizon of a black hole goes as 1 over its mass squared. So if you have a very, very massive black hole, the curvature is almost 0. And to a very good approximation, the near horizon geometry of that black hole can be described simply by flat space time. So let us now just go to flat space time and do our computations there. So let me consider flat space time and as Raphael says, let us consider matter fields which live on this flat space time in their vacuum state. Okay. So for simplicity, let me consider just a free scalar field in its vacuum at some inertial time t equal to 0. So this is a t equal to 0 a slice of flat space time and let me say that, you know, I'm going to model the black hole interior by drawing a sphere around the origin. And so whatever is inside the sphere is like the interior of my black hole, whatever is outside is the exterior and now I'm going to compute the entanglement entropy over here. So what is the entanglement entropy? Well, I simply take the vacuum and I trace over the degrees of freedom inside. All the, all the degrees of freedom of the scalar field inside are traced over and then I calculate the entanglement entropy, just the von Neumann formula, trace over the outside degrees of freedom of rho log rho, where rho is this density matrix. And I get S entanglement equal to infinity, right? Yeah, so, right, right. So as we'll see, the, 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 the main contribution to this entropy uh, comes from very short distance correlations of the field. So what happens really far away doesn't, doesn't really um, uh, uh, do anything to the leading order contribution uh, to, to, to the entropy. So it's a good approximation to do this. Um, and just exactly that point. So why do we get entanglement? Why, where does this infinity come from? It comes from the fact that if you look at points very, very close, one inside and one outside the horizon, and one computes the field operator correlations over here, as the points go closer and closer, this correlation blows up. And that is why I say that it's really the near horizon degrees of freedom which contribute most to the entropy. And so what happens outside is far away is really not, not uh, going to bring, affect things too much. Okay, so that is what I've shown over here, right? Sure. Yeah, 
So that is a, that's just modeling the inside. Yeah, this is supposed to be a, sorry. This is supposed to be a proxy for the inside of the black hole, right? So basically there's a surface and what is important for us is that it doesn't really matter what is again far away inside over here. The whole calculation is going to rely about on what happens in the vicinity of this black, of, of, of the surface. And for the vicinity of a horizon, the geometry is basically flat. So you're going to get very good answers from, from this computation. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so I'm not going to worry too much, as you'll see on this next slide as well, this geometry, I mean, I need not have made it flat. In principle, I could have made this geometry something else. But if I computed the vacuum entanglement entropy, it would always come out completely dominated by correlations which are just near, uh, arbitrarily close to each other over here, near the surface of the vacuum. So I could change the geometry over here. I could change the geometry outside, right? And assuming I could still do the computation, okay? I would get basically the same answer. It's not going to really depend on the details of the geometry inside and outside. And that is really Raphael's idea, that you have a black hole whose entropy is given by the surface. So there are some near surface degrees of freedom which are contributing. What, ha what happens far away, you know, from the surface is really not going to contribute to the entropy much. It's really something to do with uh, degrees of freedom very, very close to or on the surface. Right, right, right. Which is, yeah, and those are the, that, that is the regime one, one is using. So, I mean, if one could do the calculation, it's just harder to do the calculation because you have, you know, in a collapse situation, you have a time dependent geometry inside. You have to ask what could be the vacuum. You don't really have a uniquely defined vacuum, but you have vacuum like behavior near the horizon where things are static. And then you could look over there. So, so you can soak this calculation up. And I'm sure Rafael has thought about it more. But basically, the, the, the model of flat space-time and looking at short distances near the horizon is a good model for what we want to do. Okay. And we can discuss this more later. Okay. So for the time being, just take this on trust. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, this is really coming from the two point. But that's the whole idea, right? That this comes from the short distance structure of the theory, right? This, this, which is what I'm going to come to next. So, I mean, this is just free field theory, right? Right, but this is. It's just telling you that this is just a signal that the vacuum is a highly correlated state. That's all. I mean, you can define this whichever way you want. You can normal order this, order this and get zero. That's your prerogative, right? But that is not the point I'm making. I'm trying to tell you that the vacuum is a highly correlated state, okay? So you can, of course, define this, regulate it, do it, but that's not of interest to me. This is only to show you that you know, the reason underlying the fact that when you compute the entanglement entropy of the vacuum, it's infinite. In order to make it finite, you don't want these points to get arbitrarily close to each other. So the easiest way to, to, to not let them be arbitrarily close to each other is to put a cutoff. And for example, one could do this and put the whole theory on a, on a spatial lattice over here and compute. You know, then discretize the theory, find the vacuum entanglement entropy. And what you find is that, sorry, is that the um, entanglement entropy just goes as the area of the surface divided by the cutoff square. Okay. And uh, sorry, this should be, A should be around, if, if we set A of the order of the Planck length, then we get exactly the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, which was that area divided by four Planck length square. That's called the Bekenstein-Hawking. But then the question is, you know, why do you use this cutoff? told you that this, so this, this the Planck length is char characterizes quantum gravity and presumably somehow or the other quantum gravity regulates this calculation and you get this answer. But supposing one didn't want to appeal to quantum gravity at all, even in this, uh, in this sense, 
can one somehow still establish relationship between entanglement entropy and black hole area change? So this is the idea of Bianchi, that thermodynamics, as I said before, deals with changes in entropy. So let us do the following. Again, I've written this a little badly, but basically what you want to do is to take the vacuum, you have a black hole, you have a vacuum state, you change the state, you vary it to a state which has some energy, and that energy is going to go and fall into the black hole. When it falls into the black hole, it's going to change the area of the black hole in the manner which we described earlier. At the same time, one can calculate, since I know that I've varied it from one, from the vacuum state to something else, I can calculate the change in entanglement entropy. And if the state I vary to is excited only at low energies, it has the same ultraviolet structure as the vacuum. So the ultraviolet divergences should then cancel and we'll get some answer and then we can check whether that answer is actually equal to the change in entropy, to the change in the Bekenstein model. So that is the plan, that is Bianchi's plan. Is that clear? So let me say it a little more precisely. And once again, you're going to do a model calculation and see whether it works there before you try to, uh, you know, attend to all the infrared complications or actually having a black hole. So we're just going to neglect these curvature issues. And again, you have a huge black hole. Everything is going to happen near the horizon the, and the curvatures are not very large over there, one is far away from the singularity. And so again, one considers flat space time as the model for near horizon geometry. But here now one is going to do something different. In the earlier calculation, I'd cut out a sphere. Here I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something slightly different because the problem I want to address is, is, is more easily handled in this scenario. So what I'm going to do is to say that the null plane, right, t minus z equal to constant. So here I've this is z, this is x and y um, over here, I suppressed one dimension, time goes out and there is a null plane which I've drawn on this, this diagram over here. This is the null plane which is t minus z equal to constant and at the instant t equal to 0, I'll call z greater than 0 the out region. So this is the model for the exterior of the black hole and this is what is inside, okay? So I look at this null plane over here. This is the outside, this is the inside, and now this is sort of the proxy for the horizon. And I'm going to now consider, I want to look at a bunch of null rays which neither diverge nor which converge. So I'm going to look at a collimated beam of null rays which are propagating along this plane, okay? Because the black hole has after all a finite area, whereas over here, you know, this plane has infinite area. So I want to get back into a finite area situation. So I consider a collimated beam of light rays and those are, that is going to be my proxy for the horizon, okay? So that is what I've drawn over here. This has constant cross section. Now we'll do what I said. We'll shoot a pulse of energy. This shouldn't be at, this should be time t equal to zero, right? So I shoot a pulse of energy at some time t equal to zero towards the plane. So at some later time it goes and hits this null plane. And I shoot it from the exterior. So it crosses what I call the horizon and then due to the gravitational field of this pulse, the original light beam will converge in the way I told you before and in order to get really a collimated beam which emerges out at infinity, um, we need to send in a diverging beam, right? So and therefore there is an area change in terms of what the uh, final beam which is collimated is going to be, what, what is cross-sectional area is. And one can compute the change in area and the change in area in this context is also given exactly by the same formula. After all, it's just gravity and matter and the Einstein equations and geometry. So nothing has changed really and what you get except the area. <laughs> uh, and the change in area is just the integral of, of uh, stress energy along the horizon, exactly the same formula as before. But now let us do this whole thing with quantum matter. Right? So what, for simplicity, let me consider a free massless scalar field. Then the unperturbed case, so the, the proxy for the unperturbed black hole corresponds to a scalar field in its vacuum state. The perturbation consists of exciting the vacuum at t equal to zero and thereby sending a pulse of energy into the horizon from the outside region. And now what I'm going to do is compute the change in entanglement entropy at t equal to zero when we change the state from the vacuum to this excited state. And then we'll compare it with the area changes computed uh, from the Raichaudhuri and, and Einstein equations. Okay, so let's do that. Let me again uh, 
say what's going on. So one has, this is the unperturbed situation, one has free scalar matter in its vacuum state, it has some density matrix rho zero, which is obtained by tracing, you take this uh, vacuum state and you trace over all the inside degrees of freedom of the massless scalar field, you get some density matrix. The perturbation consists in varying this vacuum state to some nearby state E, and this nearby state E can be thought to have some stress, and model some stress energy, expectation value which is in some compact region and which is moving this way. So in the future it's going to hit the horizon at some finite time. And here we have rho which is just equal to trace over the in degrees of freedom but now this state E which is just a low energy excitation of the vacuum. And what we want to do is to compute the change in entanglement entropy, delta S entanglement which is the out of the rho uh, uh, entanglement entropy and that of the vacuum entanglement. So before I come to this computation, let me say a little bit more about the vacuum entanglement entropy itself. <clears throat> Rather about the density matrix of the vacuum state. So rho, remember rho is, I mean this 0, 0, bra, ket combination is actually an operator on the full Hilbert space. If I trace over degrees of freedom inside, then I get an operator on the outside Hilbert space. So these density matrices are operators on the outside Hilbert space. It turns out that one can show that one can write this rho naught as the exponential of some operator k, where k is the integral of the stress energy operator integrated, you know, over the outside part at t equal to 0 and dotted in, so there is the stress energy part which is just t0 and this new index is is dotted in with the boost killing field. The boost killing vector is just z d by dt plus t d by dz. In any case, the basic point I want to make is that the vacuum density matrix is the exponential of an operator which is uh, the integral of the stress energy at, uh, for z greater than zero. Okay? And this actually, on, for those of you who have seen the Unruh effect, this expression actually underlies the Unruh effect. Assuming that no stress energy actually, the state is such that all the stress energy is even in the perturbed state is coming inside the horizon, um, one can replace, I'll come to the perturbation later, right, I'm, uh, right now I'm still talking about uh, the vacuum uh, density matrix. One can use the conservation of stress energy and one can get and replace this expression by an operator expression integrated over the horizon. So again, you have the boost vector restricted to the horizon, so it becomes null over there. This is the analog of the psi vector in, in the black hole case and you have the tangent vector to the null rays. And you have this factor of 2 pi by, two by, by h bar, 2 pi by, by h, uh, h bar. Okay, so now with this background, let me now compute what the in, change in entanglement entropy is when we vary uh, from the vacuum state to, to some energy and hence from this associated density matrix rho zero to, to rho. Okay, so what is the variation of the entanglement entropy? So let me just compute delta of S over here. Delta S is minus delta trace out rho log rho evaluated at the vacuum density matrix rho zero. So I get two terms, right? The first is when I vary delta rho over here, that's this term. And then I get a term over here, which log, delta of log rho, and that gives me just this term over here, right? Trace out of delta rho. Now this is a normalized density matrix, so trace out of rho is one. Therefore, if I vary this, then the trace out of delta rho is zero. So this term drops out. And what I get is delta S entanglement is the trace out of, I might have missed a minus sign here, is basically the rho minus, oh no, I haven't, because the k has a minus. So this, this delta S entanglement is just the trace of rho minus rho zero k hat, which is just the expectation value of k hat in the, in the state E and the expect minus the vacuum uh, expectation value of k, right? Because this is the vacuum density matrix and that is <coughs> the density matrix for the, the perturbed state and k is an operator which lives on the right, on, on the outside. So you do all this and then if you uh, use the usual way of uh, uh, computing this, this difference, then one finds that for the normal ordered stress energy tensor, the vacuum contribution is zero and one gets delta S which is 2 pi by h bar times this integral of the stress energy over the horizon. So this is just the entanglement entropy change. Now this 
turns out to be exactly the same integral which we got for the change in area earlier, except for uh, that we have the expectation value of this operator rather than just the classical stress energy tensor. Okay. So if we assume that the Einstein equations are actually valid with the right hand side being replaced by expectation value of t hat mu nu, we can replace the horizon integral of this guy simply again using differential geometry and these Einstein equations by delta area over 4 g and then that reduces to delta S entanglement is equal to delta Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So it looks like G comes in because you're using gravity. So this T mu nu has to curve the space time, right? So if I want to come, if I want to, right, 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 right. I'm assuming actually, yeah, I'm assuming gravity, semi classical, but actually I don't have to assume semi classical gravity. So just like the last part of Miles' talk, this whole calculation is actually done by Eugenio in the context of perturbative gravity to leading order in the Newton's constant. And this is the effect you get where H now, you know, the, the perturbation is an actual quantum operator. The, the area is also an expectation value. The stress energy is also an expectation value. And you get this answer, okay, where this is the 4 LP square, with, with the right 4 LP square. Okay. So now let me come. Um, to the sort of last part of the, of the talk, which is this slightly negative contribution due to myself, which is really not much of a contribution. All these results were known. I just put them together and something which, which was obvious. Okay. So as I'll show you, uh, the entanglement entropy of any coherent state turns out to be the same as the vacuum. Okay, so we'll do that in the end. Let me just, just assume that this is true. But coherent states can have any stress energy you want, right? You can model your coherent state on any classical function you want and that can have stress energy which is falling. So the, if the pulse E was actually in a coherent state, its stress energy would gravitate and it would change the area just according to the Ray chaudhry equation and the Einstein equation. So you would have a change in area of the horizon, change in the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. But on the other hand, delta S entanglement would vanish because the vacuum entanglement entropy is the same as the coherent state. So you have a contradiction, there's a problem. What is the resolution? Because this seems to be in contradiction with what I just told you. The resolution is just traced back to a small mathematical nicety, which is that what we did, if you look back, was we just computed first order variations. It was just delta rho. I didn't look at quadratic terms or anything else. So just a first order variation of the entanglement. Now for coherent states, which are first order variations from the vacuum, you can check that the stress energy tensor is actually non-trivial at second order. Okay? So, the, so mathematics is perfectly okay to first order in the state variation. You don't have any stress energy, so you don't have any area change, and you also don't have any change in entanglement. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with the mathematics. It's really the physical idea which is being contested here, because First order variation really has no invariant physical meaning. What is mathematically a first order variation? You take a one parameter family of states which start at parameter value zero at the vacuum and there's a one parameter family of states. You take the derivative with respect to the parameter and evaluate it at lambda equal to zero, lambda is the parameter and then you have some mathematical result. But what you really want is a result where you send in small but finite pulses of energy and you get small but finite changes in the black hole uh, entropy, which is exactly the same as the change in the entanglement entropy. And on this count, uh, the derivation fails and one can actually show this in more detail uh, that the coherent states actually provide uh, a concrete obstruction to these ideas. Okay, so now it only remains for me to show that the coherent state entropy is the same as that of the vacuum. How much time do I have left? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So coherent state entanglement entropy. I'll try and finish it very quickly. Um, so let me first go back to quantum mechanics. I might be a couple of minutes over time. Uh, coherent state in quantum mechanics is just the action of the exponential of the creation operator on the vacuum. And then if you want a normalized state, you put in also this annihilation operator part. And the main, main 
point is that you can rewrite this A and A joint in terms of the Q and P, right, in terms of the Q and P variables for the oscillator. And what you get is an exponential of something which has Q hat and P hat, sorry, this I should have been outside, huh? I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's come inside, should have been outside. C1 and C2 are real and so what the a coherent state is, is really a specific unitary image of the vacuum state. And this holds also in free field theory. So in free field theory, which like the massless scalar field we are interested in, one can write down, again, I've missed out, this should be acting on the vacuum. I'm sorry, there's a typo here. This should be acting on the vacuum. And the operator which acts on the vacuum is an integral of local fields where F1 and F2 are appropriate smearing functions which characterize the coherent state. In fact, they are just initial data for the classical function which models this coherent state. So this is a coherent state, it can be written in this form as the unitary image of the vacuum. And what I can do is I can, this, this integral is, a, is over all space at some time t equal to zero. So I can split it up into the outside integral and the inside integral and both integrals are made up of local field operators. So these only depend on the degrees of freedom outside, these only depend on the degrees of freedom inside and so I have the f which is just unitary image u out, u in times zero. And that's what I said, u out is only on the outside, u in is only on the inside. So when I form this row hat, I have to trace over degrees of freedom inside, but the outside operators just act as the identity on the inside fields. These are local field operators. So I can pull them outside over here, and I have a trace of u in with the vacuum. But you know that the tracing operate, operation is invariant under unitary uh, uh, transformations. So I have row hat is just u out times the vacuum density matrix times u hat, u adjoint over here. And then S entanglement entropy is just again another trace of rho log rho. And again, this trace is also invariant under unitary operations. And so the entanglement entropy of uh, any state is exactly the same as the entanglement entropy of the vacuum, which was the result I claimed. Okay, so let me sum up. Black hole entropy is proportional to area. A microscopic explanation for degrees of freedom underlying this is entanglement entropy of vacuum fluctuations of quantum fields across the horizon. Getting the correct finite entropy requires a cutoff at the Planck length and we assume that quantum gravity physics provides this cutoff. If you don't want to get involved with this assumption, then you may speculate that variations of bekenstein hawking area, which are caused by absorption of low energy quanta by the black hole, could perhaps be associated with variations of entanglement entropy independent of any high energy physics assumptions. And what we, Bianchi showed this result and what we just pointed out was that this is only true for first order variations, but physically we would like to show this for small but finite variations and coherent states provide a counter example to this idea. And it turns out, I didn't have time to tell you about this, for exactly the same reasons coherent states also provide an obstruction Jacobson's ideas for deriving the full nonlinear Einstein equations from a maximal uh, entanglement entropy principle. So if you look at the first draft of Ted's paper and the second or third draft, then you'll find that, that uh, they are quite different. So thanks a lot. So one, one short question. Okay, uh, this was a very, very interesting talk. But there is something that confuses me. Uh, it seems that you have looked at a, uh, a given hypersurface and changed the state of the of the matter field, follow the follow the, the rays, and then consider the entanglement, the change in the entanglement of those across the, the, the divide that connects those rays. Right? It, but but from the your early exposition, it's clear that once once matter falls into the black hole, actually the rays that I should be tracing are now a different set of rays that are located is, outside. So what is done, what the computation is as follows, right? You look at matter which is over here, right? So it's going to hit the horizon later, right? And uh, the matter is quite far away. So it's gravitational effects, the Coulombic field of this matter over here is not, is not, it's not going to perturb the geometry much and you look at the entanglement entropy of the at t equal to zero before the matter is hit. And that change in entanglement, that's just entanglement entropy, right? You have this surface which is the same, 
the geometry is unchanged near the horizon, right? And you just compute the difference of entanglement entropy of those two states, right? The vacuum at time t equal to zero. Across the same surface, which is the same surface even in the perturbed case, because your perturbation is going to hit the horizon.